1-800-285-0000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. And we welcome you to this edition of Open Line Friday here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Tom Price. We're filling in today for uh, uh, our buddy Jack Williams, who is at a uh, network retreat today. And one of the other hard workers uh, who would who is probably would rather be at the retreat today, but he's here, and we're glad about that, is America's favorite theologian, Colin Donovan. Oh, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I would love to go up to be able, be able to go up to the retreat, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, well. Yeah, I think. Uh, there we go. I don't know. I have to negotiate this spit guard somehow. But. Yeah. It's a windscreen. It's oh, not oh a, it's not a, it's yes, not a spit let's, guard. Okay. Let's be a little more cultured and refined about it. Well, I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> So we've got some uh, open lines for you right now because, you know what, that's the name of the show, Open Line. 833-288-EWTN is our number, 833-288-3986. If you're listening outside of North America, you'll want to dial the U.S. country code and then 205-271-2985. You can also send us an email anytime, openline at EWTN.com. So here we are. In uh, the beginning of Lent, but it's not officially. Now, this is kind of confusing for some folks. It's not the first week of Lent. That would no, be next week. That will be the first full week of Lent. Exactly. If right. One starts on Sunday and goes through Saturday. Uh, but it's the Ash Wednesday and the weekdays after. So uh, we will. Uh, we're, we've fully dived into Lent, nonetheless. Lent goes way back, doesn't it? It it does. It goes back to the early church. It wasn't always as long as this. Forty days, of course, is a biblical number of preparation for something. Our Lord's forty days in the desert preparation for uh, his public ministry, the sojourn of the Israelites in the desert for forty years. So that has a long history in the church. But the church sort of backed into the liturgical calendar first by making a big deal out of Easter, as you can understand. Oh yeah. And then thinking we need to prepare for this. So let's have some preparation. And we end up with the 40 days, and then the calendar starts building around that with the other great feasts of the year, the Epiphany, Christmas, and, of course, now it's chock full of saints and Marian and Christological and John the Baptist and all kinds of other feast days. So, uh, you know, it, many people, and we, we were talking about this on called Communion, the uh, previous program here, uh, many people think, well, it means you got to give something up. Well, that may or may not be true. It's also uh, a wonderful idea to pick something up, too, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's those who went to Mass today and heard the readings for the day. The, the readings were directed at this idea that, you know, uh, if you fast and you come out and then you slug your neighbor because they took your parking space or something like that, <laughs> maybe your fast is not doing you much good. No. But to, to, to go out of yourself in love towards the other person, that's a kind of fast. It's fasting from your own ego. And so there's lots of things that we can do. There are this, the uh, corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. Uh, any of th those things contribute to a, a profitable celebration of Lent. Uh, certainly the tradition of giving up something as sort of a sign of my dedication, uh, that has a long history as well and completely appropriate to do that. Oh, very good. Well, Colin Donovan is here, and he will be here all hour long taking your questions of uh, theological bent. So if you've got a question for Colin, do give us a call, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. We're going to jump right in and begin with Annie in Kansas City, listening on AM 1090 Catholic Radio Network. Hey, Annie, what's on your mind today? Annie in um, Kansas City? Hi. Hi. Hi, um, and um, thanks to Tom for doing a double-decker. Uh, <laughs> glad to do it. Glad to do it. And, and, and Colin, I respect your opinion so much. I just, and if, I'm just going to ask a question and listen okay, off air sure. driving down 95th Street. Um, our neighboring diocese, um, there's a Catholic um, parish with a school, mm -hmm. and they had a same-sex couple apply for their kindergartner, to go to kindergarten there, and they were denied that, saying that it does not it, their lifestyle does not appear to. I don't know if that was the exact word that, that they used, but the living scenario does not accord to Catholic teaching, and such a such a thing to have a same sex couple there. You know, parents would confuse the children in mm -hmm. school, so they denied uh, entrance in, and um, then 
um, hundreds of Catholics are signing an online petition against that. And so I'm going to listen off air, but I want to sure. call in to take on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a difficult problem for dioceses, parishes, and the administrators of schools and so on. Um, you know, the, the church is thinking on on the issue of, of faith and participation in the life of the church is pretty straightforward. Okay, we don't baptize children against their parents' will. We baptize those whose parents are prepared to raise them as Catholics, to give an example of the Catholic life, and to uh, accompany them as their children growing up and fulfill their parental responsibilities of education uh, for children, which is part of the married, marital covenant. So normally uh, a church can, a parish church can have a non, say a non-Catholic go there, but it's going to be a practical prudential decision, for instance, if a church is in many, any city, any, many uh, inner city parishes which once used to be flush with Catholics, now will cater to a non-Catholic but poor population in need of education. Mm -hmm. There's a decision there to be of service to the community uh, aside from the, the fact that the parents are or are not Catholic in that context. Um, this is somewhat the same and somewhat different. Uh, there are places where they have decided to, you know, say, we're going to do, this is the way the school is run. The child will hear the Catholic faith. We're not going to pull the, the faith. We're not going to change the teaching of the faith uh, in order to accommodate you. So this is you know, this is the contract we're making with such right. a parent. And and this goes on all the time with the divorced and remarried, where one's, you know, they're trying to raise the kid as a Catholic, even though they themselves are not able to practice the faith. And this decision could be made in that case as well. Uh, I think the great difficulty with the issue of, the, of homosexual couples, however, is, or same-sex couples, is the vehemence of, their, of the ideological program to normalize homosexuality and to force it upon others. And I think that has got to be a consideration in the mind of schools because, first of all, they should not admit anybody that they've made any commitment to, to, to dash their Catholic teaching or pull their punches uh, because that's not what they're there for. You can send your kids to other schools. So why Mr. and Mr. so-and-so or Mrs. and Mrs. so-and-so? Why, why do you want to send your child to a Catholic school when you know that they will hear the church's teaching on human sexuality and on marriage? Uh, and it's going to raise questions that you, you, you yourself have answered differently from the church. And I think... There's good grounds for saying, no, because your lifestyle is, is not in keeping with the church teaching, you know, we don't believe that it's a good idea for you to send your child here. In fact, we have a policy against that. But these are all, in the end, going to be prudential decisions of the diocese and of the, uh, because it's made in other areas. But I think that's what you have to do. I remember as a, as a seminarian, having to teach uh, some grade school kids first, uh, c prepare them for first confession, first communion, and that we had that very same difficulty because uh, although we were allowed, you, in Canada you're allowed to go into the schools to teach, and we did that on the Indian reserves, many of the families on the Indian reserves were living in a various life, uh, not same sex, but, you know, a variety of uh -huh. marital situations. Sure. And so you get to the issue of the Sixth Commandment, and it's a problematic one. And, you know, I got my hands wrapped a little bit by the principal of the school, although I was supported by the rector of the seminary, precisely on this point, because today people are so shy about hearing. And then what do they do? They don't admit that they have made a mistake in putting their kid in the school. They run to the lawyers. Yeah. I think all of these are legitimate considerations for the school to make uh, because it, too, is taking on a burden uh, just as the family is taking on as one as well. All right. 
Annie, we hope that's helpful for you, and uh, thank you so much for your call. In a moment here, we're going to get to uh, more calls here on EWTN's Open Line. We'll be talking with Kevin in Iowa. Uh, Also, Bernardo listening to Guadalupe Radio. Looks like a couple of lines open for you at the moment. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Friday with America's favorite theologian, Colin Donovan. Do stay with us. Tonight on Father Spitzer's Universe, Father Spitzer and Doug Keck will be discussing the effect of Jesus' teaching on world culture, and that'll be part one of a multi-part series. Check it out tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on EWTN Radio. Back to the phones now at 833-288-EWTN. Here is Bernardo now uh, listening to us on Guadalupe Radio. Bernardo, what's on your mind today? Hi. um, I actually have two questions. my first one is um, whether you could tell me a little bit about the difference in uh, between the Catholic and Orthodox understandings of God. Uh, mm-hmm. I was recently hearing about how the Orthodox uh, see a distinction between uh, the essence and what they call the energies of God, and they see mm-hmm. those as distinct. And, uh, you know, as Catholics, we don't make any such distinction. So I was wondering what exactly is that about, and especially whether... Uh, whether Catholics um, see that view as consistent with what Catholics are saying, or uh, and if so, why so, and if not, why not? Okay. Um, the Catholic position comes at that from the point of view of that in God you have the divine essence, and there are certain things which happen at extra, at intra, what happens, and that's the the processions, the uh, uh, perichoresis or the circumstantia, depending on which you're speaking, Latin or Greek. In other words, the, how life within the Trinity proceeds from the Father to the Son and through the Son to the Holy Spirit and so on and so forth and then back again and all of that. And there are some distinctions on that uh, between uh, Orthodox and Catholics as well the Catholics pointing out the distinction in the procession of the Spirit versus the Son as being both from the Father, which the Greeks, the Eastern churches also say, Mm -hmm. but through the Son in order to distinguish the procession of the Son from the Father, uh, from uh, from the distinction, from the Holy Spirit's procession. So we we speak about that a little bit differently. Uh, And on the element of the energies, which is the theology of Gregory Palamas, who was a, um, I forget what century, 11th or 12th century uh, theologian, um, he calls them uncreated energies. And so this is not something which in the Catholic world fits in with the metaphysical understanding of God that we have. Uh, of course, it's a terminological thing because, you know, 
there can be, God acts outside of himself. We call these the missions. We attribute the creation to the Father, although the Son and the Spirit also took part. We attribute the redemption to the uh, Son, although the Father and the Spirit were not dis- separate or were not un- were not not involved in the redemption. And likewise, the glorif- sanctification, glorification, justification, all of those things uh, to the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. um, even though the Father and the Son are clearly uh, active in those as well. So everything is attributed to God univocally but also uh, individually depending on the role that each plays in the creation or the redemption or the, or the glorification. In the case of the energies, the suggestion that there are things which are not God but yet eternal and uncreated is what troubles uh, Catholic philosophy and theology. That doesn't mean there aren't phenomena there. You think of the theophanies on the transfiguration mm. on on uh, Mount Tabor. Uh-huh. It doesn't mean there are not empirical experiences of God. Uh, it doesn't mean, for instance, even on the more uh, mundane level, that God is not acting at every place in the universe. Because if he did not, as philosophy tells us, it would simply cease to be. He didn't just will it like the clockmaker into existence. He sustains it in every ounce. This is why uh, we ultimately say he's the Lord of history and that if people do bad things, they use the powers and graces and abilities, the ba- abilities he gave them, uh, but they use them in uh, wrong, wrongly. They abuse them. Uh-huh. But yet he is the first cause of all those things. So God is clearly acting everywhere. Uh, and he's clearly acting in the various theophanies like the transfiguration or in the experience of the monks or something like that. But we would disagree on the point of view uh, of the what they mean, that somehow there is something uncreated that is not God. We would say this is something that the Holy Spirit does, uh, as in mystical, mystical lights. Uh-huh. The Holy Spirit uh, accomplishes that, and Thomas would say through the angels, producing uh, these ideas in our minds. But the God, the Holy Spirit, is ultimately behind those. But those lights that are received in the intellectual vision, which the mystics have, they're not God. Yeah. Um, and so I think you can affirm the reality of the experience of Eastern monasticism without affirming the explanation. Hello, this is Open Line here on EWTN with Colin Donovan. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. Anne is driving through Detroit right now, listening on the great Ave Maria radio. Anne, what's on your mind today? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've been to a, a few masses recently where certain prayers are omitted, and I don't know if it's one was um, on Ash Wednesday, and um, a week or two prior to that, I went to a daily mass. It just, I don't know if it was to keep it short. I mm-hmm. the, um, I want to say we might not have said the profession of faith or something before before the, the Eucharist. There were some prayers, the Gloria something that wasn't said, and I just wondered, was sure. that okay, or what was the reason, if you know, for that? Yeah. Well, in Lent, the glory is not said, unless there is a feast day and the priest would be wearing white vestments because it's it's some, uh, it's at least a feast day that merits, you know, our attention. Uh, for instance, um, y- you know, if uh, St. Patrick's Day is celebrated as a solemnity or a feast in a particular country, they will celebrate that, and they will wear white, mm-hmm. uh, even though it will fall during Lent. St. Joseph's Feast Day as well, the Annunciation, very commonly falls within in Lent um, and only moved out of Lent if it's like during Holy Week yeah. or, or something yeah. like that. Um, so the glory of not being there, there are situations, for instance, uh, on more solemn masses where they jump over the penitential rite because there is a rite of sprinkling at the beginning. So the priest will come in, with the, uh, the to with the, what's called the asparagus, which means the sprinkling of the water, 
and uh, that will be that will substitute for the penitential rite, and you move on into the rest of the mass from there. So there are certain rubrics in certain situations, uh, but the absence of the glory on Ash Wednesday, if it were present, that would be wrong, okay. not the other way. And we also will not see the Alleluia again, again until we have a solemnity or something of of that strength. Um, or uh, we get through to Easter, and then we'll be hearing the Alleluia a lot. Appreciate your call, Ann. Uh, let's go now to Kevin, listening on Iowa Catholic Radio. Hello, Kevin. What's on your mind today? Hi, Tom and Colin. Thanks so much for taking my call. Sure. Um, my, my question has to do with eschatology, mm-hmm. and I have some friends that believe Jesus is coming back before the tribulation, some that believe in the middle of the tribulation, some at the end of the tribulation, uh, some believe. Uh, so I have I have different views, and I'm wondering what the Catholic position is on Jesus coming back. Well, the Catholic position is that of Saint Mark in his Gospel, um, and when he let's see here, let me pull up this particular reading. Um, Take heed to yourself while well, he's, he's warning them against the various uh, threats that they will face and they'll be hauled before kings and princes. And he's explaining the difficulties of the days. And he goes on in verse 19 uh, in, uh, in chapter, chapter 13, verse 19. For in those days there will be such tribulations has not been from the beginning of creation which God created until now and never will be. The Lord did not shorten the days. No human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those whom he chose, he shortened the days. If one will say to you, look here is the Christ, or look there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders, and so on. And then you will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. That's the church's doctrine of the second coming. In other words, anyone who comes before the final consummation of the world and says to you, I am the Christ, and does some parlor tricks as if he were the Christ, and appeals to any group of human beings to set up a kingdom on this earth that is merely political and not the kingdom of heaven lived out by man on earth through grace and perfect communion with God is not Christ, because he will come and be seen by everyone simultaneously in the world with his angels, and he will come only at the end, and anyone else before that will be an imposter, and anybody waiting for that imposter is preparing themselves to be tricked and to be fooled. This has been the doctrine of Eastern and Western Christianity continuously, and any other ideas have only come about in the last century or two. Hmm. Uh, so that that's the difference. Uh, so the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, that's just talking points of group of people trying to get adherence. Mm-hmm. We clearly are told by Christ there will be many false Christs. When I return, it will be in power and glory rather than humility and simplicity. And the whole world will simultaneously know so anybody who comes and, and reveals himself as a Christ, as the New Age Maitreya was supposed to 20 years ago. He, Tom, you're old enough to remember all that nonsense. No, oh, man. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking as, as we're talking about this, there have been many imposters. There have been many tricksters over the years, right? No, there have been. Yeah. There, there have indeed. You know, and it's uh, so where the, neither the Greeks or the Latin Catholics, Christians, Orthodox, whomever, are expecting Christ to come anyway than on power and glory to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the Creed. That's the only purpose for which he will come, and his kingdom will be the final kingdom of human history. And uh, that, that's, that's as simple as it gets. It is indeed. Kevin, great question. Thank you so much for your call. In a moment here, we're going to continue with uh, lots more of your questions on Open Line Friday. We'll be talking with Wendell in South Bend, Indiana. We'll also be talking with uh, Sonia in the Big Apple, New York City. Also, Nathan in Grand Blanc, Michigan. Do you know where that is? No idea. Grand Blanc, Michigan. 
We'll have to look that up. Way up there. That's Um, usually they usually are if you don't never heard of them. I'm thinking so, probably so. But some great questions laid out here on the board. So we're looking forward to that. We also have a couple uh, of uh, some folks who have uh, sent us questions via YouTube and Facebook. We'll get to those uh, as many as we can here on this edition of Open Line Friday with Colin Donovan. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Or you can send us an email anytime you want at openline at EWTN.com. Openline at EWTN.com. Do stay with us. Lots more Open Line straight ahead. Welcome, welcome to Open Line Friday here on EWTN. It's the uh, Friday edition of our program with Colin Donovan. And we're going to get right back to it here and talk with Sonia in New York City, listening on Sirius XM 130. Sonia, what's on your mind today? Hi, uh, good afternoon. I have a question about uh, big pharma and mm-hmm. biological drugs, especially um, FDA is approving quickly drugs such as the MOB monoclonal antibody. And I'm just wondering, what can we do? I reached out to an organization, Catholic Medical Association, where doctors still Mm -hmm. believe in the Hippocratic Oath. Right. Great great uh, organization, by the way. It is. Yes, excellent. I'm just worried that a lot of drugs are being pushed on people without uh, due process. FDA is pushing along fast, uh, big money, targeted therapies especially with the diseases uh, of the immune system where C5 of the complement cascade is being targeted, and now they're going further down the line of C3, and then we're getting into gene splicing with CRISPR. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, so you're... We've you're, got this, yeah. We, we, we've got it. your question then, Sonia? Uh, what's the ethical approach? Because I feel that uh, we're getting away from what should be living and what shouldn't be, and Mm -hmm. what's the course of action to take when you're not comfortable with it and you feel that maybe the outcome could be worse if you just left it alone and left it in God's hands. Okay. Well, from the patient's point of view, uh, you always have that liberty. The the morality of, of medicine, although... The patient need the patient needs to be well informed rega- regarding the risks and what things are, and you bring out a good point about being informed also regarding of the source of of drugs. Uh, I think there's a great danger in in that as well, and I'll, I'll mention that here in a moment. 
But it ultimately gets down to the patient. The patient gets to decide whether this is a bridge too far. Mm -hmm. It's in their hands. Um, Something which is ordinary care, meaning that, you know, it's sort of typically medically and so on and, and people routinely take, would be come extraordinary if one had a moral difficulty with it. Or if you had a, uh, for instance, you found it to be extremely sorrowful or, or, or difficult to live with the continued taking of this drug. Some drugs so change the nature of daily life that for some people they say, oh man, I just couldn't, couldn't do that. And it's a, usually a question of postponing the inevitable anyway, and mm-hmm. and and not, uh, you know, and not sim- something simple. Yeah. So that's always in the patient's care. Now the ethical side of that is, I think you pointed to a number of things. I'll just try to touch on them quickly, and that is that, um, you know, it it's inherent in any large organization, whether it's pharmacy, science, military, government any organization that has a lot of people, a lot of decision makers, and they're not intentionally going with a with say a a Catholic or even Christian approach to uh to their decision making, uh you know, that you're going to have things which are contrary to the faith. There is the lure of money, of course, thrown on top of that. Shocking. Shocking. Yeah, shocking. This is the where the world in which we live. Yeah. You know, so th- that's an influence as well. So we clearly, we write as citizens of any country, have the expectation that our government will do the kinds of checking that we're not able to do. We're not able to go down to the corporate offices. We're not able to go into the laboratories. We're not able to check the quality control. We're not able to check the sources of things. You know, we're looking, we're looking to our government to do that. So if, if, if the government is corrupted by the association with large corporations in any area, whether it's banking or medicine or science or whatever, uh, as human nature tends to get corrupted, then, you know, we have, we have an additional difficulty. Uh, but I think the nature of medical science today is creating moral difficulties that need not be there. You take the big vaccine debate. Uh, they use human fetal tissue as a substrate for growing the the viruses, which then become, you know, parts that stimulate the immune system. Um, because it's efficient for them, mm-hmm. it's efficient in giving the medicine, the vaccinations, because they can package two or three. Um, I remember when I was in the Navy, they took this, what looked like an air gun, put it up to your shoulder, and you got like seven vaccines got at the, the same, same time. Got the same thing in the Army. Yes, yeah. Yes. You know, God, you know, who knows what's going on there. Um, so it's, that, that's what they're going to try to do. But we need to be informed. They could make va- vaccines as they, available as they do in Japan that are not with those moral elements. Mm-hmm. But even worse than that is the prospect of embryonic cloning for the purposes of commercial use, in which not necessarily the embryos themselves, but tissue derived from embryos are used. And there are already some manufacturing. Uh, I think it's in food enhancers and things like this. This is spreading into industry, Mm -hmm. into the food industry, into the cosmetics industry, uh, into medicine. This is this is a very bad sign of the influence of the culture of death, corrupting the pharmacies, corrupting the medical profession, uh, even, you know, corrupting not farmers per se, but the, the food industry, agricultural industry. Uh, and that's very hard for the ordinary person to keep on top of. So you do have to be aware. You do have to read. You do have to find out uh, what is going on in the world. Um, and to avoid whatever you're able to avoid. Now, the church's position on that is that you don't, you, if you have some emergent serious need, take the, the, the vaccines uh, grown on a substrate that, you know, six, uh, aborted tissue from the 60s or 70s or 80s or whenever it is. Um, those cell lines that have been perpetuated are are remotely 
connected to the vaccine you get. There is a connection there. But it's when they start doing it in the present day and the same companies that are doing it are, are you know, they go do the cloning, they do the manufacturing, yeah. they do the distribution and everything. Now you're talking about fostering an organization, a corporation, which is actually sort of a monopoly, a vertical monopoly from the source, mm -hmm. the aborted material or the embryonic material, to the product and the distribution of the product, to the doctor's office, to the hospital. This, this is hard. This is hard morally to justify being involved with because it, it, it gets ever closer to immediate material cooperation, which where human life is involved, is never, ever permitted. So I think organizations like the National Catholic Bioethics Organization certainly are contemplating these things and discussing them. They're cutting edge. They, 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 they really, really are. are, and mm -hmm. there is no clear guidance from the church on many of these things, but the standard moral guidance of the degrees of moral cooperation, the distinction between formal and material. All of these things are important and can be applied to them. But it's becoming so ethically complicated, you know, that uh, like Sonia, we have a good reason to really doubt that we know where the stuff we're being asked to take comes from. Well, I know that uh, maybe two or three weeks ago, I just had a routine physical, and in the course of the physical, they said, uh, we think that you need this vaccine. Well, I didn't have my guard up. I wasn't really thinking about it. I said, oh, okay. I got my vaccine. As soon as I got home, mentioned it to Adrienne, and she said, well, does it contain this? Does it contain this? And I'm like, <laughs> Day, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. Yeah, and that's so those, kind, those kinds of issues. And yet even there, as I said, the church says the remoteness of it. Yeah. But as this becomes industrialized, yes. it's no longer remote. Yeah. And I think... That's a different question than using fetal tissue from the 1960s and 70s, sure. which the church has already said is remote material cooperation. Okay. All right. Sonia, thank you so much for your call. That was an excellent question. This it is was. Open Line uh, Friday here on EWTN. Let's go to Nathan now in uh, Grand Blanc, Michigan, if I'm pronouncing that right, listening on Holy Family Radio. Where is your city, Nathan? Uh, my city is just south of Flint. Okay, south of Flint. South of Flint. Very good. Okay. What is your question today, Nathan? My question is, since technically Sunday is not a part of Lent, do you still have to follow your Lenten promises? Okay. You know, I th it's certainly the common practice that, yeah, you can take a little break from them, you know, but that, you know, doesn't mean that have the seven brownies you gave up during the week or the six <laughs> brownies you gave up <laughs> during the week if yeah. you gave up brownies for the for Lent or something. Sure. You know, so it's still within Lent. So use a little moderation in what you get anyway sure. in the spirit of Lent, even though, yeah, you know, adults who give up their glass of wine, you know, maybe have a glass of wine or okay. something. Kids who give up candy, maybe have you know, a small piece a of little candy, something. a little something, okay. but keep it reasonable. It's still technically. Linked. All right. Great question, Nathan. Thanks for your call. It's Open Line Friday with Colin Donovan here on EWTN. We do have a line open for you now, 833-288-EWTN. Here is Wendell in South Bend, Indiana, listening on Redeemer Radio. Hey, Wendell, what's on your mind today? Yes, sir. Uh, I was telling the first gentleman that interviewed me, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not a Catholic, but I guess I rethought that. I am a Catholic, but I'm not a Roman Catholic, <laughs> okay. because I think Catholic means universal. Okay. And, and which, uh, so, and so when we add Roman to it, that means it's, it divides it, I, as far as I'm concerned. But the other, the real question is some of the, I know a number of Catholic, uh, Roman Catholics, and the, the thing with uh, calling people father, and also having priests, I kind of thought that uh, that Christ did away with the priesthood, that uh, and that now we have the the priesthood of believers that you can actually, you know, pray to God. You don't have to go through a priest. So, so I'm a little confused sure. uh -huh. uh, how how to rectify that. Okay. Well, you, you had a number of things there. Let me start with the first one. Uh, the proper name of the church is Ecclesia Catholica, Catholic Church. That's been 20 centuries now. Actually, we'll celebrate that anniversary in another 100 years 
around the year uh, 107, St. Ignatius, who was the Bishop of Antioch, uh, who was a disciple of John the Apostle, uh, in a letter to Rome as he was being hauled by the, to uh, the various churches, seven churches in imitation of John the Apostle, as he was being hauled to Rome for execution, um, he spoke of the Catholic Church. He used that as the proper name of the church. And it's the proper name, as we would say, Judaism is the proper name of the religion of the Jews. It's specifically for the Jewish people, although they allowed converts, whereas the uh, Christianity is for all people. Roman Catholic was a name actually given only by the, uh, by the Anglican Church, or the, in the English, to the Catholic Church, because in their theory of separation from Rome, in, uh, after Henry's wives, uh, they f- took the position that, well, the Orthodox, the Greeks, were one branch of Christianity, the Romans were another branch of Christianity, and the English were another, a third branch. And so there's the Anglican Church, the Orthodox Church, and the Roman Catholic Church. So uh, Roman is not really in the name, although it's appropriate applied to the Catholic Church because from the very beginning, the Bishop of Rome has been uh, the, the, the chief among the bishops, the pastor to all the bishops, and therefore to all the churches of the Catholic Communion, uh, certainly of the first millennium, and there's lots of patristic evidence uh, to support that uh, thousand-year history at that point. Uh, so that was one thing. Uh, the issue of the priests, uh, well, Christ did away with the Old Testament priesthood. But the Old Testament priesthood was a figure and a pre- preparation for the New Testament priesthood. And that is the priesthood of Jesus Christ, priest, prophet, and king. And so there are those who are share in that priesthood. And we see in the New Testament how uh, Paul would go around and he'd lay hands on certain men like Timothy and Titus. And he would make them the episcopoi or the overseers. Our English word bishop is at a certain way, manner derived from mm-hmm. episcopoi. And they would oversee the other presbyters or elders, which gets translated into English as priests. Uh, in, in the Latin text, in the canon law, presbyteroi is still used. Or uh, the presbyterium is used of the place where the priests are. And even in the Protestant churches, they may use that expression for uh, the special place of the clergy in the sanctuary or, or something like that. So there's a, law, there's a reason for that. So there is a priesthood. It's Christ's priesthood, uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek, as you know, we're also told in uh, the letter to the Hebrews, a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, and the reason there has there is a human priesthood is because uh, Christ went and he gave us he gave the apostles to man, the command to go to preach and to sanctify and that he would be with them to the end of the world so the apostles are in the world the successors for good or ill are the bishops of the Catholic Church and we've had a lot of ill lately but the, also most of them are good men, and they're yes. serving the apostolic ministry worthily and fittingly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this, this is what Christ's intention was, to satisfy the practical need and the reality of being in the world. And that human beings can do this, he himself told us, because when he said You're, to the young man, go, your sins are forgiven, he, said that you, he didn't say that you may know that the Son of God may forgive sins. No. He said that you may know that the Son of Man, which in the Hebrew Aramaic is a euphemism for human nature. The human nature of Christ was an instrument of God because Christ was God, but it was the human nature. That's why we put so much stock in the human nature of Christ and going to Christ and going through Christ to the Father. But it was the human nature that made that stock possible, that we could do that. And he himself chose the manner in which we would do that by going through him, acting in his human nature as he did in this world, as he continues to do through the human beings who carry out that ministry, who says to the sinner, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or even the ordinary Christian who says to the uh, unbeliever, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. 
But there are certain things that we also know from the New Testament, and we know from the very beginning because the church has the corporate memory of all of this and the writings to prove it and the fathers, that only the presbyters celebrated the Eucharist because they were the ones present at the Last Supper, and he said to them, take and eat, this is my body, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance. So the command was first for them, but it's then also for us. And so we join with them, but they act in the name of Christ or in the person of Christ. So you go down the line with confession, uh, saying to the apostles on Easter night, the first fruit of the redemption, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, whose sins you shall forgive. The very first fruit of the resurrection, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, whose sins you shall forgive. They are forgiven. To the apostles he said this. And so they forgive sins, they, or they retain them as he also gave them the power to do. Mm -hmm. And for that, you must tell them what your sins are. You must confess your sins, and the church gets to say, I don't see repentance in what you've told me. Until you're repentant, I can't forgive you. Or they say, humble confession, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father. So Christ clearly gave to human beings his authority as is patent and evident in the scriptures, as is patent in the other apostolic writings of the New Testament, which show the exercise of that authority and those charisms of the uh, overseers and the presbyters. So uh, that's how uh, how it is. As for praying, yes, you can go to God. You go directly to God. You can go directly to the Father if you want. You can go directly to the Son. You can go directly to the Holy Spirit. You can call on the Holy Trinity. You can go directly to God anytime you want. But how does Christ involve us in the redemption? He gives us thrones. In fact, he gives the saints thrones. We see that in the book of Revelation, where both the angels and the saints of the old and the new law, the 24 elders, they carry on a media, uh, mediatory pra- uh, prayer practice with prayer. They take the prayers of the people and they offer them to God like incense to show us that they mediate our prayers to God. God, in their glory, is to share in Christ's kingship. And that's evident in the book of Revelation. And they exercise that glory that they are given, the saints are, and that the angels exercise that as well by acting in, in his name, even allowing themselves to be confused as him as the three uh, the three angels who anticipated the doctrine of the Trinity did when they appeared to Abraham in the book book of Genesis. So uh, it it's um, uh, it's all there, and you just uh, Wendell, and you just need to open your eyes and look, and it's there. Um, I recommend you listen to Call to Communion because I think uh, you know Dave has walked this path and yes. he knows the the routes. He, he knows sure the does. routes and the byways. Uh, but it's all there, and this is why the church is here, and the church will survive uh, the current crisis of the clergy uh, as well. Yep. As one of the popes said to Napoleon, I don't know how you think he can destroy the church. We, you know, we bishops have been, haven't succeeded in destroying <laughs> it in 2,000 years or 1,900. Great line. Whatever it is, yeah. you know, you're not going to be able to do it. Wendell, a lot of information there. If you want to uh, listen again to the show, you can check out the podcast, ewtnradio.net. EWTNradio.net. Here now is Michael in New Hampshire listening online. Hey, Michael, what's on your mind today? Hey, good afternoon. Um, I have a theological question about mm-hmm. the unity of the soul and the body. Now, the Catechism explains that the spirit and matter in man are not two natures united, but rather, mm-hmm. you know, forms a single nature. Now, it's something my sons and I have talked about. When we die, our our soul separates from the body until the general judgment when we're resurrected to our bodies. Now, how does this bodiless soul at death right now seems against our nature, or at least it mm-hmm. seems like a paradox to me. So well, it's a penalty is, for how do sin. We understand this? It's a penalty for sin, because that's not God's intention. Adam and Eve would have been... Uh, assumed into heaven as Our Lady was. They wouldn't have ascended as Jesus did because he did that under his own power as well Mm -hmm. as that of the Father and the Spirit. But the original plan was that that unity would be preserved to the end of life and and the end of life would be when God chose. And when God chose that, you wouldn't die. You would have been taken by him to heaven. You would have have lived a, a probation on earth and then you'd gone to heaven. 
So death is a penalty for sin, and we experience it as that. We feel this wrenching from this world. Uh, the difficulty, I, I remember a, a Jesuit in uh, Seattle explaining this, uh, you know, to us, um, uh, Father McCutcheon, or he may have his name wrong. But anyway, he, he was saying that his experience, he's a doctor, philosophy, theology, he had practically all the degrees, he say the young pe- young people don't die easily, you know they drown uh, in cold water. They hold on to life because there's a tight bond with their body. Mm-hmm. But at the end of life, the old go quickly. Not just because their bodies are frailer and more prone to disintegration, but because there is this ultimate longing, you know, husbands longing for their wives sure. or wives for their, mm-hmm. but just then that longing for God or that tiredness of this existence, all of which is a penalty for sin. So, yes, it's unnatural for us, and we know that, but because our our minds, our personalities uh are formed not only in our bodies but also in our soul. We go to God fully, the person that we were in life, mm-hmm. but absent the 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 senses, absent the material elements which constitute us uh, as uh, um, creatures in this world. Uh, but that will be restored to us. Otherwise, we'd be angels for eternity, and yeah. we're, we're human beings. And so. God wants to give us the gift that he had first intended for Adam and Eve, and we will, we will receive it for good or ill because the damned also will get their bodies uh, back as yeah. well. Michael, thanks for your call. Jorge in Rosenberg, Texas. We've got about a minute, Jorge. What's on your mind today? Just very quick, if uh, either one of y'all could delve a little bit further on how, uh, I guess, the Church justifies the use of uh, statues and images in churches and religious paintings, mm-hmm. uh, when there's the commandment, I think back in the book of Exodus or the Old Testament about graven images. Okay, well, you know how at the Acts of, of the, in the Acts of the Apostles, it's shown that the Apostles abrogated many of the cultic uh, laws of the Old Testament, correct? Yeah. So yeah. they had the power, the church had the authority. Now, it didn't use, have that authority to use it against the will of God. And so the church came to understand and very soon recognize, and you start seeing this in the catacombs in the second century, you know, drawings of Christ or of Mary and and so on, uh, recognize that this is quite a different thing to make an image of a man or a woman who, well, Christ being God, than it is to say that God has the form of a bull or something like that. So idols made in God, reflecting the spiritual nature of God, are forbidden to us as well, and that's the way it's understood. But some have put it this way, God himself has made an icon of himself in Jesus Christ, and we may make an icon of Jesus Christ. Okay, very good. Jorge, great question. Thank you so much for it. And Colin Don, a very fast-moving hour. That was. Uh, absolutely. We hope that you have a wonderful Lent, my friend. You too. And enjoy your weekend. I'm going to try you as well. I appreciate that. Be sure to come back uh, next week. Jack Williams will be back with us. Got another great week of Open Line for you each and every day, Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern with an encore at 10 p.m. Eastern. I'm Tom Price. We hope that you have a wonderful weekend as well. Don't forget to reset your clocks on Saturday night.